everybody. Uh, Dr. Rajasekharan and uh, Dr. Didi, thank you. Thank you for the invitation and uh, warm introduction. Um, I, uh, and the invitation to speak uh, about distal femoral fractures um, all the way from Singapore. Distal femoral fractures um, can be uh, difficult to manage and controversial and becoming more controversial nowadays. And uh, I'm just going to give you an introduction talk about these fractures in terms of uh, some basic things as well as decision making. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge uh, my uh, fellow colleagues, uh, previous residents who uh, have contributed to the lecture. Uh, what I'm going to cover is the anatomy, deformity and radiology in brief of the distal femur. And then, um, you know, my own take of the classification of the patient, very important. Please always know your patient and the fracture that you're dealing with. Uh, some principles and uh, the basic implants used to manage the uh, fracture. And of course, we have uh, so many speakers following on, including uh, Dr. Didi with uh, more details and they will go through the details. And then uh, I will show you some very simple algorithm on how to make some decision on managing them and we'll summarize and let's start. So in terms of the anatomy, um, we do know that the distal femur is a funny shaped part of the femur. It's trapezoid and you have some good bone stock to put in these uh, screws for your distal fixation. Do note that the uh, plate usually is oblique when you put it lateral, it's never lateral. And because of the trapezoidal shape, if you add in the screw and you do image intensifying, your screw will look like it's in the bone, but it's sticking out on the medial side. And it's not a problem until the swelling comes down two weeks later, and then the patient will have issues. So always uh, be very careful here. And it's very easy for you to go through the notch of the femur if uh, and you won't be able to see this on your you know ap view of the image intensifier so please do be careful for the femur we know that we want to restore the coronal alignment and the mechanical axis and it's a very important part of the surgery of the distal femur that you need to restore this anatomy right uh, when the distal femur fractures uh, there are a few things that you have to work against uh, to reduce the fracture. And that's the deformity that's caused by the muscles. Uh, of course, the bone will shorten because of the tension of the quadriceps and the hamstrings. The adductor muscles may move the you know, fragment into varus. Uh, and of course, the gastrocnemia causes the flexion deformity of the distal fragments. But one more deformity that's often forgotten is the way the condyles, when they're split apart, gets deformed. And when you're trying to reduce them, you need to, in the axial plane, rotate one condyle in a counterclockwise or the other condyle in a clockwise uh, formation to reduce them. And we often forget to do this and struggle with it. So do remember that what you're laboring against or working against when you are reducing and trying to fix these fractures. Right, uh, radiological assessment. Uh, here you can see from the plain x-rays, sometimes it's easier to uh, view the x-rays after you've done some reduction and in initial spanning external fixator in the very severe injuries. And look here, here you see a lot of comminution, especially on the medial side, which is uh, something you must pay attention to because that is a harbinger of a meat of various collapse of your construct if you try and fix it. So pay attention if there's a lot of medial comminution and be worried about it. Of course, look for the intra-articular split. Nowadays, we don't stare at the x-rays very much. Uh, and also look for this fracture, which may be a, what we call a, a fracture in a different plane. And that's the Hoffa's fracture. And very often nowadays, in fact, in my center and in Singapore, we probably would routinely CT scan all these fractures uh, to see and look for the intra-articular fragments, whether there's a Hoffa's fragment, uh, 
and how much comminution there is on the medial side. So these are important things that you must pay attention to because uh, they relate to how you're going to manage this patient. Now, we come to the uh, part uh, that I classify the fractures. It's not a very traditional classification, but uh, something for you to broaden your mind rather than an AO classification, or I know you have Ganga classification and scores and so many things, but just look at the different fracture types. To me, uh, undisplaced fracture or a fracture in a non-functional limb or an unsalvageable fracture, this patient uh, with the fracture had a serious vascular injury that couldn't be salvaged. That would be one type of patient or one type of distal femoral fracture. Uh, don't forget some distal femoral fractures can be pathological and you may need to not miss this and think that it's traumatic because the management is not the same. Uh, of course, the open fractures and you know, you are watching a webinar from Ganga Hospital and you will learn everything about open fractures here by one of the fellow speakers. So I won't go too much into this because uh, we know Ganga Hospital is one of the leading uh, places to manage open fractures. And then you'll have the common fractures that you see, which will be closed fractures of the distal femur, which is common and that you'll be commonly managing. And now starting to be more common, you know that uh, everybody has a knee replaced or will have the knee replaced soon. Uh, and this will be uh, more and more common. And I know you have a younger population in India, but in Singapore, we have an older population, 20% elderly. And I think we're getting more periprosthetic distal femur fractures than uh, young people with distal femur fractures. So that's how I look at the different types of fractures because they would each be managed or maybe managed differently. And that's how I <laughs> simple classification in terms of the etiology of the fracture. And then I look at the patient. Well, you should always, you know, base your, never base your treatment based on the fracture alone or the x-ray alone, but also understand the needs of the patient. So we have a uh, bit bound patients or very poor pre-morbid condition patients who may be in a wheelchair, may not be mobile. You may want to treat them differently from the young adult patient or the elderly patient. In the elderly patient, uh, uh, distal femoral fractures are akin to proximal femoral or osteoporotic hip fractures. They have a higher mortality. There's an imperative to walk them as soon as possible, otherwise they defunction. Fixation is very difficult because the bone is osteoporotic. Uh, your strategy for treatment will be different. Then you have your adult patient, which I think will be the biggest group that you may be seeing. And you will have a lot of talks on nailing and plates and lock plates and so many different methods of uh, fixing them. And the biggest group with open fractures, which, which will have the commonest treatment. So we move on. What are our goals of our treatment? Early knee range of motion is important. They're often intra-articular fractures or they're close to the joint and they will cause a lot of stiffness and disability. And to do that, you want to restore the articular surface. Very important, the limb length and alignment, especially in the coronal plane. Soft tissues, uh, not a big deal in the closed fractures or in the low energy fractures, but a lot of open fractures need the management of the soft tissues. Uh, the stable fixation. So that's where the big discussion will be in the following lectures. And I think in the elderly, there's an imperative to start walking them as soon as possible. And uh, I'll show you some examples on how this can be achieved. Uh, the principles of management, of course, there is an articular component which uh, requires uh, accurate reduction, open reduction, leg screws to allow the movement, but more and more in some elderly patients, you may put a new articular surface, uh, artificial articular surface for them. Think about it, it is an option. An extremely expensive option, and, uh, but something to think about. For the metaphysis and diaphysis, uh, the current concepts would be to preserve the blood supply, you don't need anatomical reduction and uh, absolute stability, but 
you must get the alignment right, often by indirect means and allow biology to do its uh, work. So you see this, it's been fixed in a bridge fashion, lots of combination, and then uh, you see good healing if you don't disturb the biology of the fracture, if you can preserve the vascularity of the fracture. Implants wise, I think there'll be a lot of discussion, so I won't go into it. You have nails, plates, which we talk about locking plates, uh, buttress plates and leg screws. And of course you have the uh, traditional DHS and angle blade plates. But I want to highlight some uh, things about double plating, which uh, used to be in fashion, went out of fashion, it's coming into fashion again. I speak of fashion here and a combination of nail and plates. And I'll give you some examples of why they may be useful. External fixation, uh, often in the open fractures or the very severe fractures. And also there will be some cases that may not have an implant if they're non-functional and uh, undisplaced. Don't forget those bracing. So let's start with the undisplaced, non-functional, non-salvageable types of fractures. Uh, it may be a bed-bound patient, a patient with severe diabetes, infection in the foot already, uh, you know, uh, or it could be an undisplaced uh, fracture in a functional patient that you may want to do something about. You could do cast bracing or put a brace on the patient. This is a very traditional cast brace um, that can be used that allows knee movement after the initial uh, immobilization, amputation may be an option. If the patient is bed bound, it's easier to nurse the patient, but it's socially and uh, a very difficult subject to approach. But I've done amputations for some of our bed bound patients with uh, distal femoral fractures. And it may be better for them than fixing the fracture, but a very tough subject to broach. And actually above knee amputation can be functional. This 70-year-old man, he can still walk around with a frame. And this 30-year-old uh, man can still go back to his factory and work with the prosthesis if you cannot salvage the limb. All right? Don't forget those options, but not something we commonly see. Pathological fractures. So if you have a pathological fracture, I think you have to be careful to differentiate them. They may have prodromal symptoms of pain. They may hear the crack before they fall. Uh, and are unable to get up or just fall down after the crack and the x-ray looks a little bit uh, more thickened. Uh, the pathological fracture can be a secondary from somewhere else, most commonly, or can be a primary. And don't forget, sometimes there can be a primary uh, a tumor. The primary tumors, of course, we will leave it to the oncologist to salvage and amputate. I won't belabor the point. And for the metastasis, it is still a fracture that we may manage. Uh, it may come to you uh, and you may want to do palliation for this patient. And uh, palliation involves intramedullary nails with cement or putting a plate if it's very distal to cement or if the patient has a very poor prognosis, but give them three months to walk around and spend time with the family. Um, so for example, this is a bit more proximal, but it is a, a metastatic tumor from the lung, adenocea, uh, patient had some pain for three weeks, fell a crack, unable to stand up from the chair, and uh, you nail it and um, allow the patient to walk for the rest of his life as palliation. If, it's the, if the lesion is very distal and the patient has a good survival, one year, now this tumor, you know, breast cancer, they can live for another five years. Uh, but you may not get the fracture to heal. So you may want to put a prosthesis or get a colleague who can put a prosthesis if they can afford it. Uh, do note that putting in the cement is quite important for the longevity of your implant. Whether it's a plate, if it's distal or a nail, removing the, the tumor and filling it up with cement will give a lot of stability. It's almost like a bone supplement it's fairly permanent. It can last you a year or two for the lifespan of the patient before the construct fails. So do keep that in mind as an option. 
Of course, we have the open fractures. You can see the gas in the soft tissue around the CT scan. This patient had an open fracture. And uh, I will just go through very briefly about the external fixators, one or two things, but the management of open fractures will be discussed in another lecture after this. Initial management, of course, is antibiotics and the debridement. And you stabilize the bones with my x -fix. Now, I prefer x -fix right anterior. Uh, many of us are taught to put x -fix laterally on the femur and anteriorly on the tibia. I like to put the external fixation anteriorly completely. And why that is so, you have the whole lateral surface to do your plating and reconstruction without interference of the x fix pins, and you can leave it on uh, to add on a distractor or to uh, use the x fix for length while you're putting your lateral plate and your reconstruction of the joint and uh, your plating. It's very convenient. It maintains the length, you can manage the wounds, and you do your spanning, you scan, you do a scan, plan your surgery and treat the open fracture by open fracture principles, which will be discussed in the next uh, one of the following lectures. What about closed fractures? In closed fractures, um, if you have an extra articular fracture, of course, uh, if you have two choices, the nail and the plate, and you will have a, quite a bit of discussion on the nail, retrograde nail, lock plating, the bone and the bane. Dr. Didi will talk to you about. And uh, that may be sufficient uh, lateral plating for the femur or retrograde nail for a young active patient with good bone after the reconstruction. But do think about the patient who is older, has a lot of medial comminution, osteoporosis. Many of these fractures are very close at the level of the patella almost. Uh, you know, and how do you reconstruct this to allow these elderly patients to walk early? And you may want to consider dual plating, plate nail construct to make it stable and have sufficient fixation uh, for them to walk. Of course, the intra-articular fractures, uh, the more challenging ones, uh, plating is usually standard for these. But in the elderly, uh, already have osteo, uh, osteoarthritis of the joint. In uh, many Western countries, uh, the imperative to walk immediately after surgery and go back to be independent as soon as possible may mean one of these processes to be put in. It's becoming more and more common in Singapore, but it is a very expensive and therefore a difficult choice to make. Um, but something to have at the back of your mind if there is a suitable patient and you think that the patient is suitable and would benefit from it and can immediately wait bear if you can't achieve that with your fixation. Now for the closed fractures, I want to give you some examples of the dual plating and the plate nail construct. For example, in Singapore, I told you we are 20% elderly and a lot of our fractures in elderly who need to walk around and many of them are still working because Singapore is so expensive. The, 70 year old patients, 80 year old patients are still working for their livelihood. Uh, low energy injury, you look closely, it looks intra-articular, it's fairly low. Uh, CT scan shows that it is a comminuted complex fracture. The bone is very thin. Uh, you can see the trochlear lesion separate from the condyle. It may be a separate piece here, one condyle there, another condyle there, maybe some infection and bone loss. Uh, very thin cortices, osteoporosis. So you could fix this with a single lateral plate, but would you be confident to walk the patient after that? Tough. An 80 year old patient, if you think that after fixing the proximal hip, you should walk them immediately, should you not try to walk them if you can fix the distal femur immediately? How can we achieve that? Go in, uh, reduce the fracture, try and fix it with some screws the trochlear to the condyles, fix the condyles to the shaft, do double plating, lock plate on the lateral side and a plate on the medial side. I think this medial plate is a proximal tibial plate, put it upside down. Uh, Schwarz buckler approach so you can see the joint, right? Straight uh, 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 here and then the screws that are more proximal can be inserted a bit more percutaneously. Uh, this is what you can achieve through the surgery. 
start them on CPM, walk on the day after surgery when the hemoglobin and they're a bit more stable, they're elderly after all, and um, you can get fairly good results. You don't need perfect reduction. You don't have to worry about arthritis after 10 years, but you do need them to walk. Uh, something to consider in terms of dual plating. Uh, look at this fracture. It's a very low energy, maybe extra articular, very close to the very low fracture. Um, uh, how much you can look here on the lateral view, how much space you have for your plate for plating. Uh, two screws, three screws, maybe if you can fit in. Um, in this case, you see a femoral distractor applied for the length. Uh, we reduce the fracture using uh, our surplus wires with this clamp and a plate on the medial side. The plate is put more posteriorly, kind of contours and helps reduce the fracture. And you put it posteriorly so you have place for your nail. And then you could put a retrograde nail for the patient. Insert the retrograde nail. But if you look at the retrograde nail, probably the distal, you can only get one distal locking screw maybe because of the fracture is so low down. So together with the plate, of course, we try and protect the neck to prevent further fractures. Uh, and this is our final construct. Looks a lot of heavy metal. Um, this is the construct for the patient. We protect the femoral neck from further osteoporotic fractures. We don't want the patient to come back for another operation. We think uh, there's sufficient fixation distally. We allow the patient to walk with a frame. At six months, it's healed and the patient can mobilize the knee and walk, even though they have arthritis, the knee is stiff from the beginning. But uh, we get them walking early and out of the hospital as soon as possible. Uh, there are some unusual fractures. Please don't miss these. These are not a Hoffa fracture associated, uh, isolated Hoffa fracture. Take a look at the x-rays, a very small uh, fracture on the lateral condyle. Look at the CT scan. What do you notice? You notice a bit of metaphysis of attached to the fractured condyle. You can do a buttress plate and leg screws so that you are more confident on moving the patient and starting the patient on mobilization early rather than just having two leg screws for this. Uh, and this uh, plate can be a very simple plate and still allow full range of flexion. Of course, we have the distal femoral replacement, um, which is shown uh, to allow immediate weight bearing if you're worried about your fixation. Um, it's better than revising your fixation to a TKR, but never as good as a primary TKR before a fracture. Extremely expensive, uh, only for the really older patients. So let's come to the periprosthetic fractures. What should we do? Periprosthetic fractures uh, for uh, the distal femur, you have the roller back of classification that helps you tell you whether the sufficient bone stock and whether the implant is stable or not. So stability of the implant. If the implant is loose or needs revision, of course the treatment will be revision by a revision surgeon. Um, but if the implant is stable, then you have a chance of fixing this fracture. You need to know about the implant. Is there an open box for you to be put a plate? Otherwise, if there's a stem or the femoral prosthesis is a closed box, it is plate. Now, these patients are usually elderly. They have, uh, there may be very little bone stock distally. There may be medial comminution. They are osteoporotic and they need to walk and rehab again. Can these uh, dual constructs help you achieve that, give you the confidence to emulate the patient? So an example, just look at this fracture. It looks fairly simple. Uh, spiral fracture above, uh, well fixed, stable. to the prosthesis. Um, 
this butterfly, maybe this lateral piece that you see, the proximal fragment, uh, maybe just reaching the box, and the larger part is the medial fragment. So there may be at least three fragments here, and you may have very little purchase uh, of space for fixation distally. Uh, what can you do if you want to walk this patient? You may, if you put a plate, yes, you can get your fixation, and then you may ask the patient to go on crutches and hop about. This 80 year old lady may be tough. Um, even if you put a nail, how much distal fixation could you get if this prosthesis actually allows for it? That may be tough. Huh? So, what did I do? Standard lateral plating, you can see. Uh, put the plate distally, clamp it down, have the plate proximally, put a wire. Uh, this is what it looks like on the table uh, using a distal femoral locking plate. Uh, this is the view on the lateral side after the plate is in and with the outrigger. I have this, uh, this is a very useful device, this metal bar. We have it from our Tomofix uh, set, but you can just use any metal bar. What does it tell you? It tells you the alignment of the limb. Have I restored alignment? Center of the hip, center of the ankle, or less, center of the knee. You should get your mechanical alignment and restore the coronal plane alignment uh, when you're doing this without having to open up very much and get your alignment. And it's a good thing for you to check in most of your distal femoral fixation to see that you have achieved the mechanical alignment. But I was wanting more fixation to allow this patient to walk because my goal was early ambulation. So I got a femur and put it in a plastic bag that's sterile, put a template, contoured a medial plate, very long medial plate, inserted it. Um, this is the medial incision. This is the proximal, more or less uh, anterior medial incision. You have to be careful of the vessels, of course. Uh, lateral incisions for the screws, lateral incision for the lateral plate insertion. You can achieve, even in a minimally invasive fashion, dual plating, walk the patient, from the next day, it heals very well. Lots of metal, uh, minimal damage to the soft tissue, faster rehab, and we need to send our patients home as soon as possible. So that comes to my uh, end of my talk uh, with regards to decision-making and some uh, new things. Uh, sorry, a little bit over time. Always think about the patient and what are the goals you want to achieve. Which patient is this? Is it the non-functional patient, the elderly patient that needs to have early weight bearing, patient that needs palliation? Or is it a young patient that you want to start running again? Do keep that in mind. Uh, in the type of fracture, don't miss your pathological fractures. Don't treat all fractures the same. Open fractures require different uh, approach, closed fractures, intra-articular fractures, the periprosthetic fractures. And then you have this choice. The main choice is to fix, but sometimes you may want to replace or sometimes you're forced to amputate, which may be the better choice for the patient. Uh, do pay attention to the amount of comminution, especially medially, osteoporosis, how much bone stock you have to fix. And think about heavy metal constructs. I don't know if you're interested in heavy metal music. And our aim is the early rehabilitation of the patient, not the healing of the fracture, not the, uh, those are supplemental or intermediate aims. The final or main aim is early functional recovery. Thank you. Mm -hmm.